Well, look, I think it's important to give a bit of context to this because uh, that a lot of people, depending on who it is and what question you ask them, uh, have a very negative view of the tabloid press, and they had that anyway. Uh, and people th might think back to the death of Diana and you know, being pursued by paparazzi and the War of the Waleses and you know a, dec a decade or more of behaviour that many people would have thought was you know out of order. But many of the people who asked one question would say it was completely out of order, they would no time for the tabloid press, of course almost by definition by the papers. So I think people's attitudes towards the tabloid press are, are ambivalent. Uh, we don't like their intrusion, we don't like it when they gang up on people, we don't like it when they're when they are perceived to be unfair, we certainly don't like phone hacking because it looks for all the world as if they're prepared to go to any length, legal or not, uh, to get the stories. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we quite like some of the things they do and we buy their papers still uh, in our millions. Phone hacking is maybe come to be seen as if you like the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of uh, really bringing forth something that is genuinely new. Now whether it is uh, what it appears to be and it is genuinely new, whether the leopard has in fact changed its spots, uh, only time will tell. Today campaigners will say not a bit of it, it's all flim flam etc etc etc. I'm not sure that's entirely fair because the new self-regulator Ipso ha has huge powers that the Press Complaints Commission never had. You know, to fine up to a million pounds, to investigate, to take third party complaints, to insist on the placement of adjudications, and so on. So, there's quite a lot of things about it are different. It's not perfect, it's not precisely what Leveson said he wanted, but you know, it's, it's significantly different to what's gone before. Leveson said that there should be a new self regulator or self regulators, more than one maybe, uh, but that in order to give the public confidence that what had happened previously, in other words, where the press had said, OK, we see there's a problem, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do the other. And they either hadn't done it at all, or they appeared to do it and then backslid, was his view. So he, he, Levison actually said in his final summing up, you know, that I don't intend my report to end up, you know, gathering dust on the, on the, on the shelves of the Library of the House of Commons, you know, because every 10 years this happens, there's a big something happens, there's a big hullabaloo, there's an inquiry, and they basically, they all say, yes, we'll do it, and then they ignore the result. I'm not having that happen. So, Leveson's big idea was that in order to give the public confidence that any new self-regulator would remain up to the job, it should be subject to a second tier of um, recognition. In other words, another body should be set up, a recognition body, that would periodically give it a kind of health check or a sort of, you know, stand kite mark or something to say, yes, it's still up to the job. And the issue that has arisen is over how that recognition body is to be established. Leveson said, he didn't come to any firm conclusion, he said it maybe it should be Ofcom, that's the communications regulator. At which point everybody, all the, nearly all politicians and certainly all of the media said, whoa, hang on a minute, that is, that is directly state, state regulation, which, no one, which you know, it's axiomatic that the, if the press has a role to keep the state and government and the political process honest, by interrogating it and by scrutinising it, having politicians or the state involved in regulating the press would seem to be a pretty bad idea. Now, whether Ofcom would in fact be a bad thing, I think is moot, because people working in TV and broadcasting will tell you that Ofcom is by and large not a bad regulator. It doesn't stop you doing some quite difficult things. But leaving that question aside, everyone says, no, we can't have Ofcom. So where they then end up, although Leveson didn't spe specify this, was... Created was the idea that a to give it power and authority, uh, a new recognition body should be created, and created under the auspices of a new royal charter. Now the first problem with the royal charter was that a royal charter is granted by the Privy Council on behalf of the Queen. Who are the Privy Council? They are senior, current, and former politicians. In other words, precisely the people that you want to keep as far away from press regulation as you possibly can. So a big argument erupted about, about whether or not a recognition body established by Royal Charter was itself the beginning of state involvement in the regulation of the press. The press were implacably opposed to it. Uh, the campaigners said, well, hang on, doesn't, it, it, that's not really the issue. And indeed, they then changed the rules. They went and changed the law about the way that Royal Charters were established to say that henceforth Royal Charters uh, would only be changeable by reference to the terms within them. The principle of recognition body is one that Leveson, that's the thing that Leveson said should exist, and I don't hear the press saying it shouldn't. 
What I hear them arguing about is how it's to be established. And the Royal Charter problem is that it looks and smells rather too like the state being involved. I'm not sure it's fair to put Jimmy Savile uh, and Chris Jeffries into the same bracket in any sense. I mean, the, the thing with Chris Jeffries was that as a result of briefing by the police, it would appear, uh, handing out you know tasty tidbits of uh, information, the, the press, and certainly the, the popular press, formed the opinion uh, that he was a serious contender for having, you know, for, for being for being guilty of committing the crime, and as we now know, they monstered him in the most extraordinary way, and he has quite rightly been paid out very substantial damages in libel and all the rest of it. I mean, he deserves a completely clean bill of health, and I think, in fairness, most people now think he has got one. Um, the, the the Savile thing, I think, is a different case. The point about the, the problem with Savile is, you know, and this is not just it's not about profile. For an organisation like the BBC, the problem with someone like Savile is that you know he's all over the place. I mean, he's in every nook and cranny. You know, he the the, the archive is full of things with Jimmy Savile in them, right? So, uh, and of course, the other thing is, you know, in the first place, people like Savile are uh, not infrequently that they are they're the sort of people who about whom allegations will from time to time be made for all sorts of reasons, not just perhaps that it's true. Now, I think so. Were the BBC vigilant enough initially? Plainly not. This goes back, but this goes back a very long way. And I think it's also clear that that what were that acceptable standards of behaviour, well, things that were were tolerated, should I say, they weren't acceptable in the slightest. But things that were tolerated then would simply never be tolerated now. So there is a, there is an element of your time having moved on. But it would appear that there were all sorts of people involved. Uh, in inappropriate, to call it, put it as mildest, inappropriate behaviour towards young young girls, young boys in some cases, and people who otherwise couldn't defend themselves, junior members of staff and the like. And it, not just at the BBC, I have to say, I think you'll find it in institutions across the place. Are those things difficult for institutions to deal with? Of course they are. For the BBC, the Savile thing does bring with it a very particular risk. The BBC exists, lives on public goodwill and public respect and public affection. That's why people tolerate the licence fee. That's why they tolerate the institution and all the rest of it. And the really difficult thing about Savile, not that anybody who's in senior at the BBC now knew anything about it, I have no reason to believe that they did, and not that the BBC, since they found out what was going on and got an inkling, haven't dealt with it properly. I think they, they probably have. But you know what happens if the public starts to think that the BBC that they've been brought up with, that they love, that they cherish, they regard as being theirs suddenly starts to appear like an organisation that provided a front for this sort of activity. It's quite corrosive, potentially, that. For the most part, uh, investigative journalists have been have ended up on the side of exposing injustice, generally speaking. They haven't generally been on the side of causing it. I mean, not, not deliberately. So there were programmes like Rough Justice uh, on the BBC, which ran for many years, which pioneered investigations into miscarriages of justice. Think of World in Action, which which you know looked into the, the Guildford Four, the Birmingham Six. Huge, major miscarriages of justice. I mean, I made a film uh, for Inside Story on the BBC about the Broadwater Farm uh, riot trials, which, which, in, which played a part in a number of significant acquittals. So general, uh, my, in, my sense is that, generally speaking, journalists, and certainly investigative journalists, have tended to focus on injustice. And, and trying to write that rather than trying to rather than ending up you know generating more of it i think of all good journalism as investigative in the sense that i don't mean facts and figures and you know numbers and bank details and not it's not all investigate naming the guilty people it's not all investigating wrongdoing but as a state of mind all good journalism is inquiring you know and my personal view is that you shouldn't take anything any public or private authority tells you simply at face value. I mean, it may turn out to be true, but the starting point is, let's look at it, let's inquire, let's see if it makes sense. You know, because the thing is, organisations are made up of people, private and public, uh, who all have organisations, I mean, all of whom will, from time to time, have reasons not to be entirely straightforward. And so I think it's incumbent on journalists, media organisations know better, by the way, but it's incumbent on journalists to maintain that frame of mind. That's, that's the essential public service that journalism does. 